This is a talk that I first delivered at um, JCon Europe, which was in May. And it was one of, I guess, three things that I did at that conference. And um, it's actually one of the first times that I've been to a developer conference since the pandemic ended. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about is uh, like a topic that I've come here, I've come to, the, to, to this jug before the pandemic and talked a lot about uh, OpenJ9 and some of the advantages of that JVM and why it's good for running Java workloads. Um, but as part of this talk, I wanted to do kind of a retrospective on what's been happening with the OpenJ9 project over the time that it's been available. Uh, it was first open sourced in 2017, so quite a long time ago at this point. And I wanted to look back on that sort of time that it's been out there and talk about some of the, th some of the things that we've been doing uh, throughout that time period to try to help OpenJ9 be more attractive to more people and some of the challenges that we've run into in that space and, and why some people choose not to use OpenJ9 or haven't yet chosen to use OpenJ9. So uh, let me talk about all of that stuff. So first of all, IBM lawyers want you to see all of that, but we're going to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been here before. I do recognize some of the faces in the room, but if you don't know me, I introduced myself before. I've got I've, I've been doing you know JVM development and Java running the Java team at IBM for quite a long time now. Uh, I oversee a team on three continents that works on this stuff. So um, and I was one of the key people leading the creation of the Eclipse OMR, Eclipse OpenJ9, and the Semir runtimes uh, JDK distribution. Actually, I skipped something on the first slide there. Um, <coughs> that picture there. So I haven't been here since we created our JDK distribution at IBM. So in 2021, uh, when Adopt Open JDK moved to Adoptium and lots of kerfuffling happened in there, uh, IBM created a new JDK distribution called IBM Semaru Runtimes. And not everyone's heard of it, um, but it is basically the Java distribution that Java builds both for our internal products as well as for other people to use. So it's freely available, it's publicly downloadable across all the platforms that we care about. Um, and we call it Semru Runtimes. We picked Semru because of Mount Semru, which is the tallest mountain on the island of Java in Indonesia. So as I like to say as the tagline there, it's the part of Java that's in the clouds, that's good for the clouds. Because <laughs> um, often the pictures of it have the clouds and then the peak of Semeru on top of it. It is actually an active volcano, which is not such a great aspect of it, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we, we, like, we like the name Semeru Runtimes. <laughs> um, all right, so um, for this talk, uh, since I, I wasn't sure who was gonna be all be in the audience, um, I decided I, I'll give a brief refresher on I, what IBM Summary Runtimes is, and I think most of the people probably have here haven't had a, a, a good introduction to Summary Runtimes, so I'll go through that. And I'll talk about OpenJ9, the Java virtual machine that IBM has built and open sourced, uh, as the alternative to Hotspot is the other one that most people know about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why, why we build OpenJ9 and what OpenJ9 brings to Java. So when you run Java applications using OpenJ9, there are a bunch of advantages or reasons why we built OpenJ9 and didn't just use Hotspot. So I'll talk a little bit about what, what those things are. And then finally, the, the sort of the back end of the talk is more looking, that's the sort of retrospective that I mentioned on, so how has OpenJ9 adoption been going and what are the things that we're trying to do. And there's a bunch of tips in here that people can use to help get the most out of OpenJ9 if you're using it or if you decide to give it a try again, uh, even if it didn't work for you in the past. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are, that are coming soon. Uh, this is a different kind of talk than the ones that I usually do where I'm trying to just educate you and give you information and fill your heads with all kinds of data and facts and positive things about OpenJ9 and similar runtimes. This is um, a vehicle for me to ask for your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I said adoption is a thing that we're, we're thinking actively about and trying to figure out how we can drive adoption and improve adoption of OpenJ9. And so, you know, yes, I'm going to try to inform you and give you some tips so that you get some value out of this talk, but, um, you know, I, I don't know everything. <laughs> and I certainly don't know the best of everything on how to get OpenJ9 into people's hands and make sure that people are using it and getting the most out of it. So part of me being here is really a request for... Um, uh, feedback on what we're doing, what you're hearing. D 
Is what I'm saying resonating? Is it not resonating? Do you have other ideas than the ones that I'm presenting? You know, etc. So I am interested in any and all feedback. Lest you think I am not interested in hearing what you have to think, I am definitely interested in hearing what everybody has to think. So please talk to me either tonight, or reach out to me on email or uh, whatever uh, to to find me, and I I'll put up my contact info at the end of the the talk again, so that people can take a picture if you uh, feel the need. All right, so let's jump in. Um, the talk, I will say, was originally created for a slot that was about 50 minutes long. <laughs> I had to jam the last few slides. I was smoking through the last few slides of the talk <laughs> in 50 minutes. So this is probably going to go a little over an hour, I would guess, uh, just so you have an expectation. And we'll see you know, if people start getting bored and looking out the window or looking out the door while I'm talking, I'll start going faster. But um, Anyway, uh, so IBM Summer Runtimes, as I mentioned, the name is, is uh, from the mountain in uh, Indonesia. It is, the, it is the Java distribution that IBM creates for its own software products to use. So IBM produces on the order of 200 plus software products that are written in Java uh, that all have their own revenue streams, their own customer bases. Some of those products, um, their customers use Java as well. So for example, the WebSphere Liberty uh, application server expects you to write Java code yourself and also use it in the context of, of WebSphere Liberty. So um, it, it, it gets used by the customer directly as well. But a lot of those products are also just written in Java and they run on Java and they include Java so that they can run. And my team is the team that builds that Java uh, and supports it for all of those IBM products. So when people have a problem with Java, it ultimately ends up on my team's desk. <laughs> um, however, it is freely available outside of IBM products. We make it uh, public. We have a public download site where everybody can download similar runtimes. It's even true of our earlier Java 8. You know, we called it the IBM SDK for Java 8. One of the worst names ever, but um, that's IBM naming for you. <laughs> um, but uh, but it, you know, all those are also available for free downloads. So anyone can use them, and they're available with uh, some very useful licenses for people. Um, there are actually two editions um, that have different licenses. So you can take it under an IBM license, or you can take it under an open source license. The same way that OpenJDK, every OpenJDK distribution is GPL v2 plus class path ex extension. There is a Semaru Runtimes Open Edition, which is GPL v2 plus class path extension license. And then there's also the IBM license, which is what all our products use. But if you like a license from IBM, you can use it too. I guess there's no reason you couldn't use that one if you wanted to. Uh, we call that one the certified edition because we also run the certification tests. So the TCK or JCK um, that, uh, that you know, it's the proprietary test suite that Oracle produces that says this is what it means to be Java. Uh, we run that with the certified edition. So the certified edition has, has run those tests and, and obviously passed them. Uh, it has very broad uh, platform support. It runs on x86, it runs on ARM64, it runs on Power, IBM Power, it runs on IBM Z, which is, Z, which is the mainframes that we build. Um, uh, it, it, there's, <laughs> there's some misinformation out there in blog articles that you know the IBM JDK is good for IBM platforms and not for other platforms. That's not true. IBM, like I mentioned, we have 200, 200 software products. They run on all kinds of platforms. They run on Windows. They run on Mac. They run on everything. So we have to be able to run, and we have to be able to run well on those platforms, or else there wouldn't be a point to using our software. Um, let's leave that one hanging. <laughs> um, so, um, but it is not just another Open JDK distro. So, as you're probably aware, there's more than a dozen JDK distributions out there coming from different people, like Azul and well, Oracle is the famous one. Azul, Red Hat, um, Microsoft has one, Bellsoft has one, etc., etc., etc. All kinds. Amazon has one, uh, etc. Um, the thing that's unique about IBM Summary Runtimes is that we replace the Java Virtual Machine inside. Everybody else's Java, uh, everybody else's JDK distribution uses Hotspot, which is the, the one that's in OpenJDK. Um, Semaru Runtimes uses OpenJ9, so that's that green box right there. Um, so we, we take everything that's in OpenJDK except for Hotspot, <laughs> and then we take the Eclipse OpenJ9, so it's an open source project at the Eclipse Foundation, um, called OpenJ9, which is the software that um, IBM open sourced back in 2016, and we stick them together. So, you know, 
Uh, OpenJDK is roughly on the order of 10 million lines of code. Hotspot's about a million lines of code. We replace it with the couple of million lines of code from Eclipse OpenJ9. That's basically what we're doing. And then we build it, we test it, we make sure it works everywhere, and we release it. Okay. Um, about Eclipse OpenJ9, if you're not very aware of it, it was originally constructed in the 1990s, which if you're a fan of history, you'll know that's around the time that Java itself <laughs> um, was first created. And originally it was built for use in embedded devices. So we put it in oscilloscopes and cell phones and things like that. And we had to build it so that it could fit into you know, a megabyte of memory or <laughs> something even smaller. So um, it has a very uh, high focus on being able to fit into small memory environments. And that's um, played out very well for us with the cloud and the fact that memory is costly. <laughs> um, it uh, was originally a proprietary independent JVM implementation um, from around the time that Java itself was proprietary. So again, if you're a fan of history, Java has been open source since about 2007-ish when OpenJDK was first created. Um, and for roughly 12 years before that, it was a proprietary technology that Sun licensed to various vendors to build their own proprietary implementations. Um, IBM contributed this to the Eclipse Foundation, as I mentioned, in 2016 slash 2017. That's a typo. <laughs> um, as Eclipse OpenJ9. Uh, and we continue to build it there. Uh, we actually work upstream at Eclipse OpenJ9 directly. We don't maintain um, very much in, in internally except where we really have to on one platform. Um, and so there are some, there's a bunch of different technology investments, like key investments that we've made in OpenJ9 that differentiate it from Hotspot. And, and these derive from, from the reasons why we wanted to have our own implementation. And at first, we had to basically license it from Sun anyway. So we wanted to have a new one so that we could control what we were doing on our platforms. But because the software business for IBM grew beyond just IBM platforms, it's been important for us to do all these things everywhere. So as I mentioned, there's a, an architectural leaning towards using memory very efficiently, um, it, again, due to its embedded heritage. We have had a very long-term focus since about 2003. I can remember joining a team. So I joined IBM in January of 2002. And in 2003, I remember joining a middleware performance team whose one of the focus uh, points of that team was to improve the startup of Java. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've been doing that for a very, very long time. Uh, and it's taken us this long. <laughs> Uh, although we made lots of early progress on that on that front. So uh, OpenJ9 is well known for its sort of startup performance improvements. Um, more recently uh, on that front, we've uh, been looking at uh, leveraging uh, the Linux CRIU project, a checkpoint restore in user space, which allows you to checkpoint a JVM, uh, uh, sorry, checkpoint a Linux process and resuscitate it later. We're doing that with a JVM process. So on Linux, we have this instant on thing that can checkpoint and restore. It's, uh, it's similar to the crack project at OpenJDK. And in fact, we're now looking at implementing crack on top of CRIU so that things that use crack like Spring Boot, for example, um, <laughs> could actually run on top of OpenJ9 and take advantage of the checkpointing technology that's there as well. Uh, this was built in conjunction with the Open Liberty project, which allowed us to think very deeply about how you would actually use it in a real deployment of a real application server framework uh, and simplify the use case for it. Um, some of the technology that we invested in uh, substantially are shared classes cache which allows us to share classes uh, and, and, and uh, reduce class loading time, uh, as well as tying um, uh, cached JIT compiled code uh, to those classes so that we can load, uh, we, can, we can pull uh, compiled code from earlier runs of your application into the current uh, run of your, of your JVM and, and save on all the time and overhead of, of doing all of that, uh, that compilation. We have a single compiler technology, uh, which is, it's a code name, Testarossa. Uh, you might think it's a reference to the car, and it sort of is. Obviously, the, the association's nice. Um, but uh, in Italian, Testarossa means uh, redhead. And so the original architect of Testarossa, who's not me, uh, was uh, a redhead. <laughs> um, I am related to him, but it's not me. <laughs> um, 
And uh, it's a very flexible technology we've designed to basically span across all of the platforms that we use and all of the uses for compiled code, like accelerating startup versus going fast versus using less memory. All of those things are things that the same one technology. In contrast to Hotspot, where you have C1, which they use for some things, C2, which they use for other things. Sometimes they pull in crawl to do some other things. Um, so those are very different compiler technologies that are all aimed at doing different things. And they kind of try to uh, jam them together. Uh, what else? Oh, that JIT compiler technology can also be deployed as a separate server independent of the JVM. So you don't have to have a JIT running in your JVM process, so you can run it somewhere else independently. Multiple things can connect to it. They can reuse code across different uh, JVM instances. And there are lots of interesting uh, use cases for that. It helps accelerate ramp up. It helps, um, it helps reduce peak memory usage uh, in JVM so that you can pack applications more densely, etc. And the other nice thing about it is that it's a single JVM source across all of our Java releases, from Java 8 to Java 23, same source code. So when we do a release of OpenJ9, it releases, it, it builds into Java 8, builds into Java 11, it builds into Java 17, it builds into Java 21, it builds into Java 20, well, 23 is coming up. Um, and so all of these investments basically reflect the, the fact that we've been paying a lot of attention to startup and a lot of attention to memory use um, for Java workloads in addition to raw speed. So it's not that OpenJ9 is slow, it's just not the only thing that we focus on. Um, and that really, really works well in cloud deployments where you tend to pay a lot for memory. Like if you need twice the memory, you basically need twice, you pay twice as much. <laughs> so if you can use less memory, uh, if you're memory constrained, then that can save you a lot of money. Uh, or you can handle a lot more load with the same amount of cost. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about this more balanced approach that we take. So um, as I mentioned, startup and memory footprint are things that we've cared a lot about, but there's, they're not the only things that have been brought into the performance equations that we've been working on. And so we, we care about all these things on the, on the top left there when we're, when we're considering uh, evolving the JVM in ways to support different things or to pursue an improvement in startup time, we'll always measure what's the impact on on, on a bunch of these other metrics to make sure that we're not unduly affecting something else when we try to improve uh, a particular uh, metric. Um, and the reason why that's important is this point in the middle is, is you know, it's, it's one of those engineering realities, right? You try to improve one thing and something else gets worse, <laughs> right? And if you try to improve that thing, then the thing that you were trying to improve usually gets worse, right? There's, uh, you know, Pareto, Pareto wins. <laughs> um, so, uh, one of the points that I like to make in the, in the talk at this point, because it's not always true when you read blog articles that talk about performance or talk about multiple metrics for Java workloads, it's really important that you collect measurements in the same run. So you get what's the throughput, what's the memory use, what's the startup, what was the memory use under load, etc., from a single run. Because anyone can tune, <laughs> tune a run to use less memory, or tune a run to start fast, or tune a run to be fast. But if, you, if you're doing different tunings, who cares, right? You don't run a workload to do one of those things. You care about all those things generally, or some set of those things. So be careful when you're reading blog articles and they, they claim that they are looking at those things because not all of them are doing that. It's not all of them that are misleading, but you have to, be, you have to pay attention to that kind of thing. Um, uh, obviously, different workloads and in different deployments, you're going to put pressure on different things. So we have to balance all of those things. Remember, my team implements the JVM, so we have to support all the Java workloads that run on top of it. So we have to balance all of that. You know, whatever anybody comes to us and says, I want it to be 10% faster. It's like, well, <laughs> I can make it 8% faster <laughs> um, and, not, and not make it dramatically better uh, in, in some of these other ways. So. Um, Anyway, so uh, there's also this kind of semi-myth that I've heard a few times people state um, about OpenJ9 that, you know, OpenJ9 favors memory and startup over performance. And you could, like, the way I've been talking about it, you can, I, can, I can well understand why people would come to that conclusion because I tend to talk a lot about startup and a lot about memory footprint. And I don't talk as much about throughput performance or raw speed. And often when people measure it, the raw speed is not maybe what they're expecting from uh, what they've gotten from Hotspot. But um, what, it is that we're, what we're really doing here is we're really aiming for this more balanced approach where uh, we don't unduly favor raw speed. We do lots of work to make 
Java workloads run fast. The, the point is we don't just favor raw speed. We're also looking at other things. And so that trade-off sometimes means that we don't get all the performance that, that Hotspot will give, but, but we'll be a lot better on things like startup and footprint in particular. And uh, my performance architect has this nice way of saying this is like that last 10% of raw speed, you might be better off spending that on improving your startup or improving your memory footprint because you'll get a bigger bang in those metrics. And that last 10% of performance may not really matter all that much to you. So this is kind of one of our summary slides that we put up. So, you know, rough rules of thumb of what you can expect from semi run times. It will start in about half the time. If you use shared class cache and it's properly, you know, properly employed, you will start your Java workload in probably about half the time, right? Doesn't work for everything, but in general, that's kind of what we'd expect to see. So that translates into, you know, reduced downtime for your Java. Like when they come back, they come back faster. Um, uh, you can redeploy, if you're, if you're elastically deploying things, you can get up and running faster, which means you can be that much more flexible and elastic. Um, and uh, the point, uh, you'll, you'll see a point, every, all of these things, they're all fully Java compliant. So we believe strongly in the Java standards, the Java specifications, and so we always try to work within those specifications. <coughs> you'll also see that Java workloads use about half the memory. Sometimes less, sometimes even less. Um, I did a workshop at that JCon Europe, the same uh, conference where I did this talk, and uh, we ran, I ran Tomcat, um, a Tomcat workload with, um, with Eclipse Temerin and with Eclipse OpenJ9, um, and the memory, it was basically one third of the memory that OpenJ9 was using compared to what Temerin is using. So there can be quite dramatic improvements in, in terms of memory, as I mentioned, two times the memory is usually two times the cost. So if you can use two smaller JVMs that give you roughly the same, um, you know, they might give you half the performance, but, but you're saving a lot by, um, by, uh, by being able to use smaller instances. So you can either put that into saving money or you can, you can maybe handle even more load than you could with a, a single larger JVM. Um, and then the more recent things that we've done, as I mentioned, the instant on, which starts uh, Linux containers, because it depends on a Linux CRIU, um, starts those 5x to 10x faster. Um, even, even for microprofile, uh, Jakarta EE, Java EE, even Java 8 uh, applications, um, they all start faster. Um, and you can even run it in sort of weirder things. Like I did a, this, that same uh, workshop where I did it, I was running um, instant on demos in a Linux container running on my MacBook, <laughs> which isn't normally a place where you can use CRIU. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't work natively, but you can run it inside a Linux container and then get the benefit inside that container. Um, and then on the memory side, as I mentioned, the cloud compiler, which allows you to run the JIT compiler as a separate service independently of the JVM that lets you reduce peak workload. Um, and that can also, you know, in the lab, we've seen uh, scenarios where we can save 33% of the, of the cost by in a Kubernetes environment by basically shifting all of this stuff together and jamming it all into two nodes instead of three nodes. Uh, including the JIT server, <laughs> um, and uh, and it can be a, a, a boon for things. Um, it also helps a lot in uh, very small, like one of the other areas that we focus on a lot is very small containers. So one CPU or less and, you know, 200 megabytes or less, right? So really small containers and trying to run Java in that environment is sort of challenging because there's a lot of overheads associated with running Java. So we've done a lot of work to try and make things work really well there. And Cloud Compiler and the Instant On are things that, that work really well together. So just to show that with some, some nice pretty graphs, um, these are a little bit hard to read, but um, basically on the left side, I've given a container 500 megabytes of memory and then, and then ran three scenarios with two cores, one core and, and half a core. Um, the one line runs with Semru with just the default way that Semru runs, and then the second one is the one running with the cloud compiler, so there's an independent JIT service. And you can see that you know, the difference between running with Semru and running with the cloud compiler is that the, the, the curves all ramp up a lot faster. Right? You, get, you get higher performance much earlier on in the run. And the peak performance, while it might be impacted a little bit um, is not impacted dramatically, and we're always working to kind of shrink that, that gap and make it smaller. 
Um, this is from months ago, so it could actually be better at this point. And on the right hand side, so there I, I set the memory to a value and, and experimented with the, core, the number of cores changing, so how much CPU resources changing. On the right hand side, I set the two cores and then changed the, started reducing the memory. So you can see if you've got 450 megabytes, you know, everything runs and it gets about 4,000 um, transactions per second. Uh, if you give it 400 megabytes, but you have a local JIT compiler, eventually the JIT compiler blows the brains out of the, of the container. It asks for too much memory, the container can't handle it, and it gets, uh, I'm, I'm running it here with no swap just to make it dramatically bad. <laughs> so it runs out of memory and it just basically dies. If you run with the cloud compiler, you can actually run it with 225 megabytes and you can see it has the same high throughput that it had before. So you can run a very small container. Um, and yes, you have to deploy a server, a JIT server as well, but um, it's, uh, it's a nicer way to run uh, these kinds of things. Uh, incidentally, if you ran this with Hotspot, I believe um, it's, it's even at 450 it struggles. Uh, it will have much, much slower ramp up because it's not used to running. Well, in two cores, it can probably do okay. So actually in two cores, hotspot will probably be around the same. It might be a slightly higher throughput, but if you start shrinking this, it'll, it just dies right away. It can't, there's no way it can fit into that um, small amount of memory. And then, you know, more dramatically, if we get, this is running, uh, this is actually running a monolithic application. I prefer the data that uses microservices because everyone's hot on microservices lately, but <laughs> um, <laughs> although it's waning now. Um, so this runs, this runs a big application and eight pods on a, in a Kubernetes cluster. And the, the purpose of these diagrams is to kind of show what happens with all the different metrics when you're running in the same runs, right? So the gray bars are all the same run, the blue bars are all the same run, the green bars are all the same run and the blue uh, purpley bars are all the same run. So, um, and then we just look at whether we deploy various uh, different options. So, um, the, the no SCC, the guys, no shared cache um, is the gray. We add a shared, the shared class cache to improve startup by, that's that half improve of startup. That's what you kind of expect to get by default. And then uh, when you deploy the instant on, which does a checkpoint restore, um, you know, you checkpoint the Liberty server after it starts up, and then you just restore that process on running. You can see it has a dramatic improvement in startup. That's the lowest startup across the, the board. If you look at memory use, there's three different ways of looking at memory. The, the, the left set of bars is just RSS um, memory under load. So this kind of average uh, memory that's being used under load. Um, and you can see that you know, uh, combining all of our stuff is, you know, using instant on with the cloud compiler gives, you know, basically the same uh, level of, perform of memory use as everything else. However, the middle set of bars is the peak memory that gets used. And the peak memory depends more on, you know, the compiler going crazy trying to compile code at the beginning, and it needs lots of memory to do that. So it, the peak memory use is usually early on in the, in the run, but it, it, it is the thing that you have to use to size the container, basically. So with the JIT server, um, it allows us to the cloud compiler, it allows us to use much less memory. And then, uh, and then in terms of throughput, they're all basically the same. There's a little bit faster ramp up that's, that's being done with the cloud compiler. That's something that we've actually improved quite a lot in the time since this graph was made. So it's, uh, that, that number keeps going up. We're uh, driving very hard on pushing the curve to the left um, with the, the JIT server, especially in very small environments. Uh, we miss anything here? Yeah, so the, <laughs> so the basic conclusion that we like to make here is, is that similar runtimes is really the best deployment option if you're running Java in the cloud or running Java in containers uh, because it will save you the most memory and it will provide you the best performance over all the, over all the, all the other options. It's used a ton by uh, IBM products, um, over 900 releases if you count all the quarterly updates that people pick up and so on. We have a breakdown of you know, lots of different use across JDK releases um, and, uh, and it's available, you know, all kinds of, like it's available on Docker Hub, it's available from IBM, it's available on SEK Man, it's available with uh, uh, Setup Java for your GitHub actions. So it's, uh, it's freely available for everyone to use with no, no license and no restrictions. Now, um, I'm gonna switch gears here now into the sort of, so how, 
are people actually using it? <laughs> kind of part of the talk. So adopting a new JVM like OpenJ9, if, you're, if you have Java workloads that are using Hotspot, is actually quite easy in most cases. Um, for a lot of, like I would say, well more than 90% of, of people doing this, it just works out of the box. Like it just runs and it, and it shows you know, a lot of the advantages that we've talked about. Sometimes you have to do some tweaking to get shared class cache to work properly. Um, and some people get confused in the middle <laughs> and you walk away because it's not working. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that's, uh, it, it, it basically just works. One of the reasons for that is that it is an independent implementation of the JVM specification. So it is implementing all the JVM specifications, the same ones that Hotspot's implementing. And so, you know, those things are, um, uh, are, are, are uh, it's gonna just operate similarly. However, um, there is some actual uh, interesting value of having this independent implementation, right? So uh, uh, I don't know if you guys remember a, a little bit earlier in the year, there was a, an, an update that happened with Mac OS 14.4 where Java kind of went kerplooey. It just didn't work on Mac OS 14.4 <laughs> and it, it boiled down to um, some of the ways in which the hotspot JVM manages writable code uh, memory regions on Mac OS. Um, OpenJ9 does that differently. Again, it's an independent implementation. So we had no idea how hotspot did it. We did it a, a different way. And that way continued to work just fine. So 14.4 was a non-event for us <laughs> updating. Now, that's not always going to happen, obviously. It's going to go one way or the other way. But it, was, it is an interesting uh, example where, you know, having an independent implementation was actually a useful thing for <laughs> people. Um, and so for most applications, it'll start faster. It'll reach peak throughput faster. It'll use less memory. Um, and it will get better um, as, we, as you um, upgrade the J JDK because OpenJ9 keeps delivering new improvements into every level of the JDK at the same time. However, <laughs> unfortunately for me, I guess, not everyone uses OpenJ9 in summary runtimes. Um, you know, it's something dramatically wrong with the world, obviously. <laughs> but why is that? Why isn't everyone using OpenJ9, right? I just gave this great pitch where, you know, you've great startup, great footprint, everything works fine. It's all great. Well, why not? Why wouldn't everybody use it? So when I started thinking about this, I tried to start putting some structure around, like, what does it mean to adopt? You know, and this, I don't claim that this is any kind of great insight into adoption or the, the stages of adoption for anything. And it's not really specific to, op to OpenJ9 particularly, although it, it has some aspects that are, obviously it says summary runtimes in OpenJ9 in places, but you could replace that with X and it would work for a lot of other things. Um, so, so what are the stages that someone goes through in order to adopt it? Well, first you have to know about it. <laughs> so, um, so let me ask, so who here had heard the term Semru runtimes before they read my abstract or came here. Right, so lots of you are sitting there at number one. <laughs> 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 right, you don't even know it exists, right? Can I also so, say, it sounds yeah. like it's a Java 9 implementation, the naming. Yeah, okay. Yeah. When okay. I first see that, I think I was Java. Everyone <laughs> says that, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I, I mean, <laughs> it's been called J9 since before there was a Java like 1.2. <laughs> so, and you know, we got there first, I could say, but I, I understand the, <laughs> the feedback and unfortunately we're not gonna change it now because Eclipse opens the trademark and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, um, uh, we try to clarify that every time we talk about it, <laughs> let's say, but you're not the first person to point it out for sure. Uh, especially given when we open sourced it, <laughs> Java 9 was, <laughs> was the release that was coming out around that time. So it was even harder to break that association in people's heads. Uh, but we'd like to believe that since we're now on Java 21 and we're releasing OpenJ9 for Java 21, that <laughs> like, clearly it's not, yeah, no, <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with that for, for sure. Um, so anyway, so first stage, you don't even know it exists. So in order to adopt it, you kind of need to learn about it, right? So <laughs> people need to talk about it. Um, but then even once you know about it, you know, okay, I know about a lot of things, but that doesn't mean I've tried them, right? So you have to be motivated to actually take a step to actually try it. So 
Um, and then you might try it, but for some reason it didn't work. Like maybe you're one of the 5% of applications that were just broke, like something broke, something didn't work, or there's a command line option that didn't translate over or whatever. Um, so it didn't work. Um, even if you get past that, it runs it properly, but I didn't even bother measuring to see if it made a difference. So it's kind of like, eh, whatever. Um, and, or I might have measured the benefits, but not, didn't find them compelling for some reason. You know, maybe it didn't perform according to what Mark claimed that it would do. And so, you know, I'm not that interested in doing it if it's not going to be any better, right? Um, and even if I get to the point of measuring compelling benefits, I might not be able or willing to support it because uh, it's extra work to have to support a completely different JVM. Maybe I don't, I'm not familiar enough with it. I don't know the people in that community. I don't understand, you know, what, like I can't just commit to running um, open J9 initially. Right? I'm probably still going to run with Hotspot 2, so that's extra cost, right? I got to test two things. I got to do it all the time, right? Um, and then, but, but some people get past that and they say, all right, I'm going to run my application with some Ruben Times Open J9. Sometimes I'm not willing to commit all the way and say I'm never going to, I'm not going to run a hotspot at all, but I'll support running on Open J9. And then finally at the end we get to the nirvana where, you know, I only run my application with, from my perspective, I know it's not everyone's <laughs> way of approaching it, but, you know, at the end of this I only run my application with some Ruben Times Open J9. So I was very happy to find that when I went to JCon Europe and I talked to people in Europe, you know, a place I've I probably haven't been to in a decade at all, like just even like physically present on <laughs> on the continent for a decade, I went to this conference and I ran a workshop and there were people in the workshop that they only run open chain on. They just they say they they're fully bought in, they're running it and they want to know the best way to run it and, and get the most out of it. They run all their workloads on it. So, you know, there are people like that out there. Um, IBM <laughs> runs 212 products with probably, I don't know, $10 billion of revenue <laughs> collectively, all on top of this stuff, and they're, they're bought in, they're committed to it. So it is possible to get to eight, but not everybody is. So in this talk, I can't talk about all of these. I thought these, these ones are actually, I think, the most common ones that people run into in the stages of adoption for OpenJ9. Um, <laughs> as I pointed out, not everybody in the room even knew about it <laughs> beforehand, so it's good. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for getting past number one. Um, but I'm I'm still gonna uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on three and five. I probably could talk about number two a little bit, but I mean that's really just going out and talking about it and educating people about what the benefits might be. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these three things and go into a little bit more detail. So what are we doing? to try to increase the awareness of SEMRU runtimes and OpenJ9. So, you know, the starting point is lots of people do know about it, right? If I go to conferences, I'll, I'll ask in my talks, you know, who's heard of OpenJ9? A little better than this room, uh, which I'm disappointed in, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I go to developer conferences and it, usually at least a quarter of the room will say they've heard of OpenJ9. And if it's an OpenJ9 talk, it's probably more like three quarters of the people in the room will have heard of OpenJ9 before. They're not just showing up randomly to listen to an OpenJ9 talk. Um, but there's still lots of people who don't. And um, given that we've been around for seven years now, it's kind of curious to me that the more people don't know about us. Um, so I, th I started thinking about some of the reasons why that might be. So. Um, I think one of the reasons is that for some people they just don't care, right? JDK's, you know, the, whether it's OpenJ9 or it's Hotspot or how it's deployed or how it's run or whatever, it's, it's, it's just a means to an end, right? I got some Java code, I need to run it. I don't really care how fast it, like it runs really fast, so I don't, like it, it's done in a second or two seconds or whatever. Who cares what I'm using to run it? And it just doesn't matter enough. Um, and, uh, I mean, obviously, this is one that we're trying to work on because, you know, we believe that there's lots of advantages to running OpenJ9, especially on the deployment side, the operational side of, of deploying Java applications. So we, we focus on those people that tend to run significant Java workloads as part of their businesses and, and try to encourage them to, uh, to, to learn more about OpenJ9 and the, and the advantages that it can bring. Um, part of the reason is actually an IBM E thing, which is Java is not really part of our business model at IBM. IBM doesn't give 
I was about to say something <laughs> <laughs> not quite uh, <laughs> uh, uh, above board. But anyway, uh, it, it's just not part of IBM's business. We don't sell Java. We don't make money off Java. We Not a single dime. Um, we sell support for Java, enterprise support for running Java. But we have never made money off of our JVMs. We don't sell them. And so what that means is um, our businesses don't see a lot of benefit to investing in advocation for our JDK outside of the use of IBM, right? If there's no return. There's no return on that investment. So why would I send IBM people out like Teresa and Nathan? Why would I send those people out to conference after conference after conference to talk about our JDK if I'm not going to make any money off it, right? Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> making money, IBM is a business. At the end of the day, making money is an important consideration. <laughs> and so that factors in. Um, IBM does the bulk of our advocacy for SEMRU runtimes um, and for OpenJ9, but because there's no uh, business objectives for it, there's not a lot of money for it. So we don't get to go out to all those conferences. I mean, even those conferences that, that you put up at the beginning, we won't have people at all of those conferences because we just can't afford to send people. We do have a developer advocacy team, but it's across a large number of things. It's not dedicated to Java. Um, the other aspect here is um, we run into problems where, yeah, it's, it, this isn't really an awareness thing, but it, like open source projects can't generally afford to test all these variants of, of different JVMs. And so we're actually hoping to refocus our advocacy efforts here. We, 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 we have tended in the past to send people to developer conferences and try to talk to developers. In the end, I'm not sure how many developers really care. Um, I mean, it's, they, they understand the value of less memory. They understand the value of faster startup. But in the end, it just doesn't matter enough to a developer what, what they're doing. It's the operational people that matter. And, and ultimately, they care more about all the packages that they have to use and all the libraries that they're using. What are they using, right? They just inherit whatever the JDK is from the basic framework that they're using. Um, and so we're hoping to, to um, refocus a little bit here and focus more on sort of the core projects and libraries that people tend to use and try to advocate within those communities more directly rather than talking to people like yourselves. It's not that you won't see us at conferences. <laughs> it's not that we won't come to Jugs and talk to people and, and, and find out about stuff, but um, we are hoping to refocus a little bit here. And then there's a, there's a pragmatic one, which I didn't talk about in this talk, but I mean, some of you probably uh, were aware of this. You know, there was this Adopt Open JDK community where everybody goes to get JDK binaries. It's an open community that was formed uh, to produce Open JDK binaries across lots of platforms. That community was moved to the Eclipse Foundation and became the Adoptium Working Group. Uh, IBM is a member of that, Red Hat's a member of it, Azul's a member of it, etc. Lots of people are there. Um, however, one of the things that changed is Adopt Open JDK used to build Open JDK with Open J9. And as part of the move to the Eclipse Foundation, uh, the Eclipse Foundation does not have the legal rights to do that from Oracle. And so Adoptium only produces Eclipse Temrin, which is Open JDK with Hotspot. And so uh, IBM stepped in to fill that void. That's where the creation of IBM summary runtimes came from. It's we, we picked up the work that Adopt Open JDK was doing, uh, and we did it using our Java license because we have the legal right to do it. Um, but it caused a lot of churn <laughs> in across the community. Uh, people didn't understand what was happening with Adopt Open JDK and Adoptium and and, open, and the distributions, you know, he created Eclipse Temerin and IBM Simra Runtimes, and it's all these different names, and it's all very confusing, and nobody seemed to really want to be direct about the reasons why everything was happening, because a lot of it was happening behind closed doors. Um, and, but the ultimate effect was a lot of confusion around all of this stuff, and I think OpenJ9 and, and Simra Runtimes got a bigger hit from that than, uh, than anything else. So it, it definitely affected the amount of adoption that we were seeing from OpenJ9 uh, and the experimentation that people were doing with it. Um, however, it has improved a lot since 2017. I mean, we've, we've been improving every year, I think. More and more people learn about us. Um, and summer runtimes came out in 2021, so it's also it's about three years. Actually, it's three years old this month. Um, um, but we'd, we'd really like to expand it even more. So. This is the first point in the talk where I'll 
I'll actually ask you for your advice. I don't want you to give it now because otherwise the talk will just go on forever. I mean, you can throw something out if you really think it's important. But I would like to talk to anybody later who has advice or thoughts on this, on this, uh, on what we could do to, to do this better. The second area of, uh, of um, uh, challenges people have with adopting OpenJ9 is that they run into some kind of problem with it when they try to run their application. So uh, I mentioned before OpenJ9 is an independent implementation of the Java specification, the JVM specification specifically. Um, but those specifications do not, and I'll argue should not, uh, dictate all user, all possible user behavior. Because, uh, for example, memory footprint used is a user visible behavior. <laughs> and I don't want that specified because I want to do a better job on that. So there's this category of stuff that happens when you run Java applications that, that are not really controlled by the, the specifications. So what are some examples of these? <laughs> When the industry challenge uh, moved from open, uh, Oracle JDK to any open JDK version, there's a whole bunch of stuff that changed in, the, in how the JDK was built. Like what stuff is included in the JDK? Is web start there or is it not? Or you know, there's all kinds of different, you know, whose fonts are you using? <laughs> Which renderer is there? You know, all sorts of stuff where there were Oracle proprietary implementations in Oracle JDK 8 and there are open source implementations in Open JDK 8 when people build Open JDK. All of those things have potentially, you know, different effects when people run Java applications with them and specification has nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's just, there's different stuff there. Um, and, um, you know, Java Web Start was probably the biggest example of this that hit so many people when they're running, uh, running desktop apps and, you know, figuring out how to get the JNLP and, you know, that whole kerfuffle. Um, obviously, there's lots of documents out there that describe how to do this. There's nothing specific here to SEMRU, right? It's, this is just a problem that the industry run into, but it's, it's something that happened despite the fact that there are specifications for things across different JDK releases. And that's even hotspot to hotspot, you have that problem. <laughs> um, there's also this category of capabilities that are not part of the specifications that, you know, hotspot may have implemented that OpenJ9 didn't implement. Um, there's also lots of stuff that OpenJ9 implemented that Hotspot never implemented, but they're not part of specific. They're not part of the standards, and you know, while people who use OpenJ9 might use those things, uh, you know, they're not things that the industry trips over when you try to move from Hotspot to OpenJ9. So the biggest example here is JFR, the Java Flight Recorder, uh, which was brought into Hotspot in Java 11 as as a part of JEP 328. It doesn't have a specification. <laughs> at all, um, and, it, and it basically generates a bunch of data output that it communicates with Java Mission Control. There is no specification for that data format. <laughs> it's a great data format, if you look at it. <laughs> it's quite well designed, but there's no specification for it. So how's OpenJ9 supposed to develop an independent implementation of that, uh, especially if you're worried about um, the legal implications of reverse engineering something that a litigious company implemented. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. <laughs> Let's leave it at that and not say any more. You all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, uh, however, so, so in, when it happened in Java 11, it was kind of like this thing that came in as a JEP and it was like people were like, okay, whatever. Um, but it's, it's been augmented quite a bit since Java 11. It's become quite useful and it's actually been, now people are building dependencies on it. So there's a bunch of things in Maven that if you download it, they, d they expect JFR to be there. And if you're running on OpenJ9, they don't find JFR and things break. <laughs> uh, so that's badness. So uh, we've been actually looking at what it's gonna take to implement JFR for OpenJ9. Uh, we're actually uh, further along, when I, when I gave this talk, we were very early on in that, that process. Uh, we actually have a POC operating uh, at IBM that's showing um, it generating JFR, uh, um, uh, like flight recorder output and reading it into JMC and displaying a profile. It's not complete, it's not functional, it's not to the point where I think people could use it, but we're, excuse me, we're getting there and we're trying to work through, work around this whole, there's no specification for it. And also there's some interesting licensing concerns that I won't get into uh, with how JFR is implemented. The third one, which is one of the big ones actually, is command line options. 
because uh, the command line options between hotspot and openj9 are not always consistent. Many options are consistent. These ones are actually, you know, they've been around forever. And so, you know, there was no real, um, there's no, there was no value in the ecosystem having a different um, command line option for setting a max heap size or <laughs> specifying that you only want to run in the interpreter, right? These are very basic things and they're, they're basically designed to be the same across all JVM implementations. But these dash XX options, which have become very popular <laughs> over the last few years, um, they're actually optional and JVM specific. Um, and on top of that, you know, there's a lot of um, momentum in the industry around uh, developing tunings, command line tunings for performance around hotspot and tuning the crap out of it. <laughs> if there's an option, somebody will find a way to use it and test it and find ways to make things better. Um, and it'll appear on their command line. And if that's not a command line option that OpenJ9 recognizes, then that's a potential migration problem, right? The worst thing you can do is say, I'll oh, get excited about OpenJ9, fantastic, I'm gonna try it, change the command lines, you know, install OpenJ9, get it on the system, run it, bam. And it fails because the command line's <laughs> broken, and then you have to figure out what the hell's wrong with it. Uh, or worse, it runs, but something crashes or something. <laughs> Um, so there are some things that we've done here to try and make this easier on people uh, so that they don't, they can at least get started running the application. Um, the first one is that we automatically set the ignore unrecognized VM options. I mean, something Hotspot created that option, but we set it by default. It's not set by default with Hotspot. Um, and in fact, we also map some Hotspot specific options to open J9 things, even though it's not quite, you know, it's, it's really hard for a lot of these options, they're very specific to the technology and the implementation of something in Hotspot. If the, if the corresponding, if that thing doesn't correspond to something in OpenJ9, it's really hard to figure out how to map it. So we don't do that for very many options, but there are options where, like, where it's reasonable, we try to do it, right? Um, for example, uh, if G1GC is an option on the command line, we can map that to our balanced GC policy, which is a region-based collector because the intent is kind of obvious. Uh, although we don't do that in all cases. <laughs> um, uh, so, so with that option turned on by default, it means that applications probably run, even if they have some of these hotspot specific options there, but it may not be ideal performance um, or it might not be the ideal configuration. So, you know, pluses and minuses, right? Like we got you running the application, but, but you've already tuned that thing to within inch, an inch of its life on hotspot. OpenJ9 is not going to compete on bare, like non-tuned command line options, probably. Um, so it's it's it just kind of postpones the problems. But at least it it you can use the the minus ignore unrecognized VM options. So that will cause your your JVM to not start, but it'll tell you which things that you tuned, and maybe you can think about ways that OpenJ9 can tune, or you can engage at the community and ask them what's the thing we should be doing here. Um, we've also introduced in, a, in some cases these compatibility, these, I, I, I hate this option <laughs> at the end here. We've reluctantly gone down this path in the case of Elasticsearch. Um, we introduced this compatibility equals Elasticsearch option um, for some of the more troublesome hotspot specific requirements. So for example, Elasticsearch when it starts, it expects, it actually checks to see that the dash XX plus G1GC or use G1GC option is set. OpenJ9 does not have <laughs> a G1GC. It is definitely wrong to have that option set when you're running OpenJ9, um, even if you're running in the balanced state, really. And so uh, we tried engaging with the Elasticsearch community. Uh, there is some history here between uh, people who worked on Apache Solar uh, and Lucene, uh, who are the people who are also working on Elasticsearch and IBM in the past, which is unfortunately coloring that relationship. We have not been able to get the Elasticsearch community to budge on, on being on willing to support or even just test with OpenJ9. And so we were forced to introduce this option to kind of give people an option, because obviously lots of people like to use Elasticsearch. Um, and there's no reason it doesn't work on OpenJ9. <laughs> it's just there's, there's community issues here. Okay, another problem is vendor specific classes. So things like com.sun.management. I'm not Sun. <laughs> Eclipse isn't Sun. It's not a com. <laughs> so OpenJ9, in some abstract sense, has no business implementing a com.sun.management class, right? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and a lot of these things aren't really meant to be directly used, but they are. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's got to be some rule, uh, some theory about that that you know, uh, you create it, somebody will use it. Um, uh, so like there's some examples of these things like hotspot diagnostic MX bean is one that we run into quite a lot. Uh, again, you're not supposed to use it directly, but lots of people use a cast against it. So if, if you're going to cast against that class, that class had better be there. <laughs> and so uh, we've actually gone so far as to implement that thing, even though it, it uh, rubs everybody the wrong way. There is a bare bones hotspot diagnostic MX bean class now in OpenJ9. Um, it doesn't do much itself, but it's there. There is actually an OpenJ9 diagnostic MX bean, which extends hotspot. And that's the one that get returned if you ask for the MX bean the proper way. <laughs> But lots of people try to cast it to the hotspot specific one, so we have to have that class and it has to do the right things when you do that casting, so we create it. Um, there are also a bunch of tools at OpenJDK that don't support OpenJ9 and some maybe never will. I don't know. Anyway, we've, we've uh, worked on a bunch of these that are actually distributed with the JDK, like jcommand, JPS, jmap, jstack, those things. Those things never used to exist because IBM never created them, but OpenJDK created them. Uh, we've now written our own implementations of those things which attach to OpenJ9 and provide the same facilities or largely the same facilities um, that are provided for Hotspot. So there's compatibility there now. Uh, JMH is one, the micro benchmarking harness that I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a problem for us. It relies on a bunch of Hotspot specific options to run and to hide things and it has a sort of model of what it means to write a micro benchmark. Like it's basically, its model is, you should be wanting to run this thing in C2 with everything being inline that it would normally be inline if you'd run the program for a long time. And it, it tries to manufacture that set of uh, situations so that Hotspot will optimize it that way. Unfortunately, OpenJ9's compilation technology is much more flexible and like the right thing might be to compile it at cold, the right thing might be to compile it at warm or hot or scorching, right? There's all these different options and there's no kind of way to represent that in JMH. Um, also, it, it doesn't necessarily understand all the inlining controls that, that JMH is trying to provide to make sure that you get the performance that JMH thinks you would get if you ran that in a real uh, workload environment. So we're still considering what to do about that. We might actually have to write, we do have our own kinds of um, um, micro benchmarking tools. It's a fun name of BumbleBench. Um, <laughs> which tries to stabilize, you know, do a, uh, run a program until the performance stabilizes, basically, rather than trying to force it to behave a particular way, you run it until you get stable performance out of it um, and let the JVM do the things that it's supposed to do. Um, but we're still, we're still really wrestling with this one and trying to figure out how we can help, you know, sort of bridge the gap between what JMH does for Hotspot and what you would get if you tried to run OpenJ9. Uh, you really get, uh, wrong results if you use JMH to measure OpenJ9 right now, just because it doesn't, um, it doesn't control the things with OpenJ9 that it thinks it should. And so OpenJ9 has to figure it all out itself and it isn't given time to. Uh, the Java object layout tool in Project Lilliput is, uh, it's, so it's a tool that lets you query various things about Java objects, like how big are they? <laughs> How big is the, what is the instance size for an object of this particular class? You can ask JOL to tell you that. Uh, you can ask it the offset of a field. Um, all kinds of dangerous things. Um, unfortunately, this tool right now, um, for unknown reasons, throws an illegal state exception if it starts on anything other than hotspot JVM. <laughs> so that's kind of tough. I don't want to lie and say openj 9 is hotspot just so that you can run the JOL tool. That doesn't seem like the right thing to do there. So. Uh, hoping to find some middle ground there <laughs> on how to do this. Um, if I have to, we'll fork our own JOL tool that <laughs> doesn't do that behavior, um, but does some other things that we think are okay. Um, so, yeah, and that last comment, right? We're, we're trying very hard to try to address all of these problems upstream because we feel that's really the best place for it, um, but it's not always welcome, <laughs> sadly. Like the, the alternate history of the HTTP user agent. <laughs> okay, what you'll have to tell me about that. So. What if we didn't all say we're Mozilla? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, another similar to command line options is environment variables. 
Um, so there's there's some environment variables like uh, Java options and uh, uh, there's a tool related one too uh, that Hotspot uh, will read in order to get command line options from. So you can pass options in on the environment um, from the environment. Uh, tends to be quite useful in uh, Docker containers and things like that. Um, uh, <laughs> but Hotspot, um, anyone who tries to run a Java application on both uh, OpenJ9 and Hotspot is going to run into the problem that at least one of them is going to fail because there are you know, like OpenJ9 specific options on the Hotspot command line or Hotspot command line. You know, OpenJ9 ad ad adapts to, to, to Hotspot, but not the other way around. And so um, we've tried to um, introduce our own versions of those Java options. So there's an openj9 underscore Java options where you can put things like the tuning for the shared classes cache, which is a, something that doesn't exist in, in Hotspot in the same sense and doesn't use the same command line options. So you can do that without breaking Hotspot. So you can still run, you know, uh, until you've committed to openj9, you can still run your workload on Hotspot. System properties, you know, there's like this all seemingly almost endless list of these things. We had real problems with java.vendor, if you can believe that. Um, <laughs> so uh, lots of people uh, assume that the vendor, a certain string being present in java.vendor means something about your JDK, like what kinds of libraries or packages it includes or all kinds of things like that. And uh, yeah, that's generally just a bad idea. Um, I, I recommend against it strongly whenever I see it, right? If you, if you depend on something like a particular security implementation, you should be testing for the presence of that security implementation, not assuming some other thing tells you that it's there, like java.vendor. So when we moved from IBM SDK for Java 8, uh, where we had a proprietary security implementation for JCE, JSSE, all kinds of stuff, um, to uh, SEMRU runtimes, which is all based on OpenJDK and SunJSSE and SunJCE, et cetera. We had all these packages that all of a sudden blew up and couldn't find what they were supposed to do because they saw the Java vendor string had IBM in it because it was a JDK that was produced by IBM. And they got confused and decided to say, well, the security implementation must be this one from IBM then. And all kinds of things like JDBC drivers and all kinds of crazy stuff broke. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, so the solution to this, we did actually go through a period and you know, we took it seriously. I mean, even though <laughs> on the one hand, I would, you know, my, my, uh, my, my response to that is like, well, you shouldn't do that <laughs> is, you know, like the right thing to do would be something else, but you can't always tell people that. Uh, they can't always afford to make that change because it may not even be the code, like the person who's talking to you, it might not even be their library that's doing the wrong thing. So you have to find some way of solving this for people. And so what we did in the end was we actually changed our Java vendor string for a while to International Business Machines Corporation so that it didn't have the string IBM in it in either upper or lower case. <laughs> um, and, then we, and then we documented you know, we, we broadcast to as many people as we could and say like, we're doing this now, but we're gonna change it back. <laughs> and this is when it's gonna happen. So change your, change your stuff. It mostly worked. <laughs> there are still people that run into this periodically, usually when they're running older versions of stuff and et cetera. Um, uh, and you wouldn't believe the conversations I had to have with IBM legal over using that name instead of IBM. <laughs> Or maybe you would. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway, so like in kind of summary here, we have fixed a lot of the sort of usability quirks that block this stage of open J9 adoption. There's still more to do. Um, I would be the first person to tell you that this is not a complete list. There are other things that are not on this list. And, and you might know of things that I don't even know about. Uh, maybe not, because not many of you have heard of similar runtimes before <laughs> this. But, but if you do, um, if you know of any of these things that I don't know of, please bring them up so that we become aware of them. Or open an issue at the community, that would be even better. Because that's where we engage with most people. <laughs> All right, so uh, the last one that I'm gonna talk about is uh, that maybe you tried SEMRU runtimes and it worked, but you didn't see the benefits that, uh, that people like me told you you'd get. Right, so you ran it and it seemed like it was actually slower or it didn't run as well or it didn't have fast startup or it used more memory than you thought it should. So um, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time going through this one. This one's kind of a beefy part of the talk. So um, I'm sure everyone in the room knows, you know, measuring performance benefits is not easy, right? It's a very complicated process and it's, it, you can get it wrong. Most blog articles don't have the space and the, art, the authors don't have the time to really do it properly. I won't say they don't know how to do it properly, but they don't have space to do it in the article, right? And so it can lead to a bunch of misleading things. And I've seen lots of articles that have tried to measure the performance benefits of OpenJ9 and just completely got it wrong. And, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I don't mean to whine, but, <laughs> it, it, uh, but I will. Um, <laughs> uh, it can be tough to engage with the authors and try to work, get them to work through. It's like, what did you do for this? What did you do for this? And eventually you get to a point where they realize they've done something wrong and they completely disappear from the conversation. Like they just don't want to engage after that and you can't get it fixed. So it's, it's out there, it says what it says and you can't get it fixed. So, so be aware, there are lots of articles out there that make mistakes and come to incorrect conclusions about the performance of OpenJ9. That's not to say that OpenJ9 is perfect or that you <laughs> will definitely get the performance. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that OpenJ9 is perfect. Um, there, there are still things that OpenJ9 gets wrong and there are still scenarios where it doesn't do the things that I've talked about. Um, and so the question is how can you tell if you're in one of those or if you're in some weird thing where it's, something's just not properly configured. And what I'd like to do in the rest of this talk is go through some of those things. So um, I'll talk about, that's a dangerous place to put that. <laughs> Try that. Um, <laughs> So the first is, can you, can, you, can you detect what's going wrong? Can you, how can you avoid it? And, and, and sort of some things along the way to say, like, what should you pay attention to when you're trying to measure various things uh, with OpenJ9 specifically? So let's start with memory use. I'm gonna go through basically the advantages that, that Semru has. What, what happens if your memory use isn't really improved? The first thing to do is check how you're, how you're measuring it, right? And measuring, differ, there's lots of different ways that you could measure memory use. We measure it one way, and that leads us to a conclusion that <laughs> you're using memory in a particular way, um, and that you'll see advantages. If you choose a completely different way to measure memory, you might not come to the same conclusion because the tools aren't necessarily showing you the same view of what's going on. So some of the things that we do, um, so for example, I showed the commands that we use on Linux and Mac OS just using PS to, to get the RSS of a, of a process. So resident set size is one of the key things. There's also PSS that you can use, especially if you're running many different JVM processes on the same system. You'll want to look at PSS. Um, it, it is a more fair representation of the memory use of all of the different JVMs across, um, across, those, across the system. Um, one of the other things we use is fairly obvious Podman stats, because uh, it's basically showing you what the RSS memory is for the containers. Um, uh, so I, I guess the point is make sure you're looking at resident or proportional set size, that's RSS or PSS. Don't look at virtual memory space, like virtual memory use. That's not gonna give you a fair, like we're gonna use tons of virtual memory and most of it doesn't matter because it's not resident, so who cares, right? You're not charged for it, you don't need it. Um, it's, it's not the important thing to look at. Um, uh, some things to be wary of, lots of blog articles like to look at what the memory use is before any load's been applied. Uh, this is common in uh, framework uh, type, um, uh, like measuring the memory use of, say, Spring Boot or Liberty or Quarkus. Uh, because they're trying to measure what's the overhead of the framework itself or the runtime of the, the, the runtime itself, they measure world, uh, the memory up to the point where the, the thing started. It's ready to go, but I'm not applying any load. And that, that might be useful uh, for comparing different frameworks at that point in time, but it is unlikely to be useful for comparing what the memory use is going to be under load. Because uh, once you start applying load, it's going to start creating objects on all kinds of different code paths that haven't been exercised yet. And it's just not going to be the, it's not going to be the same result. So things that can be very small after, after starting the framework um, may not continue to be small when you're applying load and I'll give you an easy example. Um, I could, if I was uh, trying to mislead people, <laughs> as soon as I finished starting up my framework, I could disclaim all the memory in my process. And my memory use in resident would be 
practically zero because <laughs> it's all been pushed out <laughs> of, of the uh, onboard caches and I have zero memory use. But who cares, right? Obviously that's a trick <laughs> and it's not valuable for me to do that other than to raise people's eyebrows and say, ooh, what, how did they get to zero, <laughs> right? Um, but their very next reaction is going to be, oh, well, that's cheating because uh, it is cheating, right? But, but, but it's an example of how that metric doesn't necessarily correlate with the thing that you're actually trying to optimize, which is usually what, how much memory you're using when you're running load. Um, also be a little bit careful here when you see metrics that people create. Uh, Quarkus does this a little bit actually. <laughs> Um, that try to look at, like, when they, they measure memory use under load, but they try to kind of prorate it by the transactional workload, you can get some very misleading performance results when you do this because um, it's very easy to save memory by doing less work. And, <laughs> it, you know, if you take the number of transactions out of the equation, you don't know if you're comparing somebody doing 100 transactions per second with something that's doing 2,000 transactions per second. And, and those are very different scenarios. And it's, it's understandable that it's not just going to be a linear thing by transaction necessarily when you're operating at such different workloads. So um, I'm not saying that you will definitely get misleading results if you look at these metrics, but just be careful of what you're getting. And it, it's always nice to put it in the context of how much throughput you're getting, uh, like uh, knowing how much throughput is being delivered. Because um, if, you're, if you're doing more, it's understandable that you use more memory, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so like I say, op OpenJ9 commonly reduces memory use by a third to a half uh, compared to the baseline. So if you're not seeing that, what are some of the reasons why? Uh, and some of them are surprisingly kind of obvious, but people get tripped up on them. Um, there's a lot of performance um, advice out there that says set dash XMS equal to dash XMX, right? Just don't, like, just make your heap one size and don't change it, <laughs> right? And they're right. That gives you the best performance <laughs> because the GC doesn't resize the heap. It's not doing these expansion and uh, inflation things. And, and you'll get the best throughput performance by doing that. But you'll also lock the JVM into using a heap size that's way larger than it might need. You might be able to deliver very close to that same throughput level with half the memory, which is kind of what OpenJ9 does, right? It's trying to find how much memory do I need to provide that throughput rather than just give me everything and I'll give you what I give you, right? So, um, you know, uh, <laughs> if, if, if you're not seeing any benefit, first thing is to check that this isn't, is that this isn't stuck in your command line somewhere. Um, it's also possible, if you're not seeing any difference, that you've just tuned the heap size to about the point that OpenJ9 would pick anyway, right? So there are workloads where Hotspot and OpenJ9 will use about the same amount of heap and can run in about the same amount of heap and deliver about the same performance. It doesn't always happen. In fact, we see lots of enterprise workloads where if you run Hotspot with the amount of memory that you give to, that OpenJ9 is using, it will fall over. It just can't do it. Or it will provide very low performance because it can't fit the, all of the JIT compiler overheads into the same memory footprint that you've given it. Or it will take a very long time to ramp up. So. Um, you know, but there are cases where sometimes, you know, you just, just happen to have tuned it already to the point where OpenJ9 would run. So you're not going to see much difference then. Um, there's also cases, although they're less common, where heap size doesn't dominate the application memory use. Like lots of people allocate a two gig heap. That's probably most of your <laughs> process memory size, right? So, but there are cases where people allocate like tons of binary buffers and, and uh, or they have a bazillion th um, threads which have large stacks which get replicated again and you get lots of memory in, in sort of native memory areas. openj 9 is not going to be able to help as much with managing those off heap resources because it's really kind of you said to allocate this stuff so we allocated that stuff, right? Uh, whereas, you know, size of the heap, um, size of various data structures inside the JVM, you're not telling us what to do, we're just managing that memory and we're trying to do it more efficiently so we can do a better job in that case. All right, so what if you turned on the shared class cache and it didn't improve startup? That seems counterintuitive. Uh, I've been telling you that startup's going to improve by 50%. <laughs> so uh, again, the first step is how, how do you measure it? So um, I, I'm going to argue that for transactional workloads, it's best to measure actually time to first response 
So it, the, the time that it takes you to actually get the first response out the door, which means there is some load being involved in that and, the, and you're exercising the code paths of a transaction at least to get there. Um, however, uh, most frameworks and app servers, they measure the time it takes to initialize the framework. So it's the point that you get to, with Liberty, there's a message that comes out ready for e-business <laughs> that's existed since the early 2000s when e-business was the word. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, um, so, so there's like, you know, we wait until that string comes out. When that string comes out, that's basically the sign that the server is up and started and ready to process work. And so we measure it at that point. Um, um, but there are some common problems that you can hit in the configuration of the shared class cache that can um, make you think there aren't benefits there or that you're not measuring benefits. The first one is, um, if you're measuring what we call a population run, the first run and not the second run. So the way the shared class cache works is it starts empty, you destroy it, <laughs> you run the workload, it populates the cache, and that actually can be slower than a, than a normal run. And then all the subsequent runs after that will be fast because they'll run out of the cache. But if you measure that first run only, you could be confused into thinking that it didn't start faster, it actually started slower. And in fact, again, in the workshop that I did for this one with Tomcat and Temerin, <laughs> if you measure, um, or sorry, not Tomcat, and with Tomcat and uh, OpenJ9, Semer runtimes, um, if you turn on the, the, Semer, the, the shared class cache, it's actually three times slower in that first run. So if you're expecting it to be half the speed, right, in that case, I think it was 1100 milliseconds it started with Temerin, and it started with 2,900 milliseconds <laughs> with the first time you ran with a shared class cache. It's like, whoa, that seems wrong. <laughs> um, this, like, clearly they've been lying to me, <laughs> right? Um, but if you run it a second time, it's 500 milliseconds. So it's even a lot faster. So, um, so there's that. Um, some ways that you can get um, you know, the, the way that this can happen is you can be running a container with a shared class cache created on a local volume inside the, um, inside the container. And because of the way containers work, the local volume goes away every time you run it. So <laughs> you run it, you populate it, and then the container goes away and it throws away the cache. And then you start up a new one and it's a fresh cache and it fills it in. And so you're always running a cold run, basically. That's not uncommon. So you're basically always running a first run. You're always getting slow performance. Um, but you do need to do that one run to populate the cache uh, and then measure it with a population run. So really what you want to do in, in with shared class caches in your CI pipeline when you're creating your containers, you want to do the population run in the container that you're building. And then the cache gets built into the container. Then you can even run it as read-only, which is, makes it even faster on startup. And then every time you deploy it, you'll deploy with a cache in place. Uh, you can also run... Uh, you can also put the cache onto a persistent volume. That's a little bit slower because the, of the way that uh, Docker or Podman works. Um, but, uh, but again, you can also add this read-only thing once you've generated the cache um, so that you don't have to open it in a writable way. You can avoid some mutexes and things. Um, sometimes if you're running a really big thing, <laughs> uh, the default shared class cache fills up and it doesn't hold all your classes, right? So it fills up with some of the classes that you use, but not all of them. Uh, or it might, all, it might fill up with classes, but we haven't been able to store uh, much of our JIT compiled code into the cache. And so you don't get all the benefit that you, that you want. So there's this command you can run with print stats and the name of the cache and the directory that the cache is stored in. And if you see that line cache is 100% full, it's pretty clear that you've filled up your cache. <laughs> and there might be an opportunity for you to further put more stuff into the cache um, and, uh, and work uh, even better. Um, so you can run with a larger size option. I think by default it starts out with 60 megabytes or 90 megabytes now. I can't remember. 80? 80? Is it 80 megabytes? Do you remember? I think it's 80 actually because um, we bumped it a little while ago. But um, anyway, it can grow larger than that. Um, and some large applications do, especially if you're running J uh, Java EE stuff um, or even big Spring Boot stuff. Your uh, cache may also be suffering from stale entries. So the, the one word in shared class cache that is confusing is the cache, because it's not actually a cache. <laughs> you can't evict anything from it. 
uh, the way you evict is by destroying it and then rebuilding it. <laughs> uh, so if your um, if your jar files are moving around or the mount point is randomized in your container, say, uh, those entries might keep getting changed and you might eventually fill up and end up with a whole bunch of stale classes in your cache and then you've got no space for stuff to, that you're not actually able to benefit from what's in there. Uh, so again, uh, destroy the cache and rebuild it and try to do that less. <laughs> um, you may have changed your command line options in a way that invalidates some of the things that are in the cache. So for example, uh, with our JIT compiled code, we store it in the cache, um, but it's specialized for the GC policy. Uh, if you change the GC policy from uh, generational concurrent to balanced, for example, we have to put different write barrier code into the, into the code, and so it's not valid what's in the cache and we can't use it. So we check all those things, it won't crash, it won't fall over, or use the wrong code in the wrong environment. We check for it, um, but it may not get used. Um, and another example of this is uh, our compressed refs has, a, has a, a shift amount that's stored for the AOT code. Actually, I think we fixed this one recently, but we had, depending on how large your heap size is, uh, we will shift compressed references by a certain like one, two, three, or four bits. And the code obviously has that size built into it when we, when we generate it. So uh, now I think though for AOT, we just default to the largest size and just assume everything is the largest thing and, and accept that some objects may be further apart than they need to be. Um, anyway, the main point is if, you ch if you're changing the command line options, it may make what's in the cache invalid. So you should really rebuild it if you're gonna do that. Um, there are uh, messages that get printed out if you run with dash x share cache verbose, it will, uh, it will, it will print out um, failed compatibility checks and it will tell you what thing changed, basically. Um, and just destroy it and restart and you should be good. Um, one of the other things to, to get this shared class cache to work is we need to uh, instrument the class loader so that it will look in the class cache to see if it's there and not, uh, not create it if it's, if it's not there. So uh, the, 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 um, the specific class loader class that we've instrumented is URL class loader, and that is commonly used as the base for a lot of class loaders that people do application class loading for, but not all of them. Um, in fact, there are some Apache projects that seem to want to create all of their own infrastructure for doing that and uh, muck with the delegation orders of, <laughs> of class loading and all kinds of crazy stuff, which I'm sure is perfectly valid use cases, but uh, it does have the effect that they don't use URL class loader and that means they don't share classes. Um, so we've actually added an option. Uh, this, is, this got added since the talk in, in uh, JCon Europe. We've added this uh, plus share orphans option that you can actually share classes from any class loader. It doesn't save all of the time because you still have to construct the class bytes um, and then in, in those other class loaders. So they'll basically, when they try to define the class, they'll get the bytes and they'll look up in the cache to see, we'll look up in the cache to see if those bytes are already there. And if they're there, we'll use the class from the cache. Um, in the case of URL class loader, it will look before the bytes are even loaded first. So it saves in a little extra time. So you don't get quite as much benefit from this, but the main advantage is that if there's a class in the shared class cache that can be used, it will use it. And that means we can also store, store compiled code for any of the methods that are that are in it. So there, you can get a, you get a big benefit out of that. So for example, um, uh, JBoss uh, got an 11% startup benefit by doing this when we turned this thing on. So, um, and, and JBoss doesn't use URL class loader. <laughs> it's, it's another one of those ones that doesn't use URL class loader. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so there's some interesting diagnostic options that you can use to learn more about you know, what's going on with the shared class cache and look for unusual things that are happening. Uh, if you, you need to figure out what your class loaders are, you can find that out from Java core files, which you can you know, generate very easily by sending a, a signal three to the user signal to the, um, to the JVM. Um, and there are a bunch of diagnostic techniques also that we've documented on the, on the web for all that. Um, what if you find it's slower than you think it should be? So, um, Again, repeating it, independent JVM implementation that can replace hotspot, but the goal isn't to copy hotspot. <laughs> so differences should be expected, but 
um, we do want to be within that that kind of 10% range, right? Remember that like that last 10% might be better spent on other things. We do want to be within that kind of 10% on performance. Um, and there's actually a bunch of things that we've done recently that actually should improve that uh, this um, for for OpenJ9 workloads. Um, some of the differences that can affect um, what you're measuring. So <laughs> uh, we haven't looked at we haven't focused on on uh, sort of what the ecosystem considers benchmarks for probably 15 years. Like we just don't look at them because they're not good models for the product code that uh, IBM ships, for better or for worse. <laughs> um, I won't say that that's a good thing necessarily in all cases, but <laughs> uh, it does mean that if we, if we were to spend time optimizing a benchmark, uh, that would be wasted effort from the perspective of improving IBM Java workloads. So we we have not been spending time in that way for a long time. Um, so we focused on optimizing real code, real IBM code, if you like. Um, but it does mean that it's it's um, th so one of the benefits of benchmarks is that they tend to hammer on certain primitive kinds of things in the JVM, like how fast does it take. How, how long does it take you to allocate memory? How long does it take you to do array copies? How long does it take you to do um, allocations out of the TLH, et cetera? Um, and so uh, like real code is much more flat profile type stuff. So that stuff doesn't really float to the top. You don't see it as easily. So you can fall behind without really realizing it. <laughs> and some of that has been happening over the last 15 years as we've made you know, tons of improvements in different areas. And there's been some cruft that unfortunately got left in the code that we are now fixing because it's been highlighted by some of the, it actually wasn't benchmark code. Well, it is a benchmark, but it's a different kind of benchmark. Um, it's a benchmark that runs for three hours. <laughs> Um, but it did uh, end up highlighting some things that we had started doing improperly in our allocation sequences and in array copies and things like that. So, um, you know, or, you know, array copy sequences where we hadn't, we didn't have the optimal sequences for particular processor versions, things like that. So we've been fixing a bunch of those things um, and, um, and that's making some, some good improvements across the board. So we, you know, we're, improving the performance of that three hour thing, but we're finding that it's also improving the performance of other things that, you know, we sometimes measure but don't look at for, you know, and some, and some of that, like we ran Decapo and it got, you know, 10% faster just because we'd been doing other stuff that, you know, wasn't specifically aimed at Decapo, but, but they helped. Um, <coughs> OpenJ9 does take, this is the one I put down, right? <laughs> um, OpenJ9 does take a little bit longer to find application hotspots. Uh, it has an adaptive, I didn't talk in great detail about this, but it has this adaptive compilation framework that tries to um, use a little bit of compilation resource to get some performance. And then if the method continues to take a lot of time, then it invests more compilation resource to, to, um, to improve the performance of that code more. And if it continues to use time, then it keeps, in, you know, it sort of gradually gets to the point where it, it will spend a lot of time trying to fully optimize a piece of code. But, um, but it takes time to get through that sequence because we have to, we're watching the application. We can't afford to watch very carefully because if we did that, it would introduce overheads. So it takes some time to figure that out sometime. Um, although we are trying to help with that and we're also doing some stuff that helps improve on our compile time so that we can actually do more compilations faster and that helps us also get, get through this a lot more uh, easily. Um, uh, so um, there's lots of benchmarky type code that runs for a very short period of time. That may not be long enough for OpenJ9 to really show you what it's capable of. And unless your real uh, workload runs in a few seconds, it's not the right thing to do. You should run it for longer and see if it gets better. So don't give up right away. <laughs> um, Hotspot has been OSRing to and from JIT code for longer than uh, OpenJ9. So this is a JIT compiler technique. It's called on stack replacement. It's a way of transitioning automatically. The, the JVM just does it. Um, transitioning between a stack frame that's being interpreted and compiling the code and being able to translate into the, into the JIT code or vice versa. Um, and that's been a more fundamental part of how Hotspot optimizes code than, than the way OpenJ9 has. 
We are doing it, and we have been doing it for a while now, but it's not quite at the same caliber. Um, unfortunately, this can matter quite a lot. It, like it, can, it can make a big difference in microbenchmarks, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, um, and you know, there's lots of, lots of benchmarks out there where uh, all of the code that's being measured is in one method that gets executed once. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, that's just not a good fit for OpenJ9 because it can't do the OSR as well um, out of that. I mean, we do have technologies that do that, but it's just not the greatest way of doing it. And it's not the greatest way to write most benchmarks, um, but it is how a lot of things get written. Um, and uh, um, so we end up getting stuck at a lower optimization level because sometimes we rely, well, we're relying a lot more on another invocation of the method coming along and picking up the higher optimized code. Um, this hasn't just been a negative for OpenJ9, though. Um, one of the downsides of the approach that Hotspot takes is that you get this thing called deopt storms, where if the, if the code actually is changing behavior quite a lot and hitting the spots where it has to OSR out of the JIT code, you end up like popping back and forth between different versions of the code because it, it compiles it, runs it, oh, it's not this one, so it pops out, compiles it again, runs in, oh, it's not this one, does it again, and it keeps doing that over and over again. Uh, we don't have that problem in OpenG9, <laughs> so that's nice. Um, it also means like uh, Hotspot uses OSR points to basically uh, optimize away code paths that it doesn't think are going to happen, and it uses that very aggressively. So not all decision points in applications are heavily biased, right? Not everything is 90% one way and 10% the other way. Some of them really are 50-50. And OpenJ9, I would say, tends to do a better job of optimizing those 50-50 kind of scenarios. So it really boils down to like what your code's doing, that, to you know whether it's a, a good or a good or not. Uh, I mentioned DMH being a problem earlier, right? So um, it really helps Hotspot generate good code. Doesn't help OpenJ9 quite so much. Um, and like I say, our adaptive compiler is much more nuanced than than Hotspot's C2 or C1 to C2 transition. So it's hard to, to get that to work properly. So it's actually not uncommon for performance benchmarks. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is an independent point. <laughs> it's also really hard to write performance benchmarks <laughs> that actually tell you what you think you're, you're measuring. Uh, the number of times I've read a blog article that says, you know, this thing measures allocation speed and it shows that, you know, this, this, this when I run this on hotspot, it, it has really great allocation rate and, and uh, when I run an OpenJ9, it's slow and therefore OpenJ9 can't allocate objects fast. And then you run the benchmark and it's got nothing to do with object allocation. Like it's just, it's doing some other thing that's actually dominating the time and what you're measuring is floating point performance. <laughs> but because you didn't look in detail into what it's doing. So anyway, it's, it's really hard to do this. I don't have any advice for this other than, you know, <laughs> be very careful about conclusions that people draw from the type of benchmark that you've written and what that actually means about the thing that you're running. Uh, I did mention that there is some, some uh, command line option mappings that happen between Hotspot and OpenJ9. So this is just an example of some of them. You don't have to read through this, but it's, it, a lot of this is connected to GC versions because there's lots of different GC technologies in Hotspot. There's lots of different GC technologies in OpenJ9. There's generally a sort of correlation, if not, there, if it's not one-to-one -one mappings, but we do some mapping. You can see we're doing, you know, if there's kind of rules around you like if it's the heaps this big then we'll use balanced otherwise we'll use gen con if you told us to use g1 gc because that's kind of the right thing to use for open j9 so we're doing some processing like that to try and make it work better here are some tips specific to open j9 that are things that i've seen <laughs> that come up uh, relatively often uh, i've seen people say uh, I want all my code to be compiled, so I'm just going to run with dash x count equals zero, compile everything, and that should be the best performance ever. <laughs> and the problem with that is that it's almost always worse <laughs> for a bunch of reasons. Um, so first thing is you're telling a JIT compiler to compile everything. That's a lot of, that can be a lot of methods. And it takes time to chug through all those methods. So if you're, again, if you're not running the benchmark for very long, long enough to get through all that workload, you're gonna measure somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and on top of that, you're gonna measure what your benchmark is doing plus what the JIT compiler is doing. Uh, and you're not gonna come to a very good conclusion there. Second thing, which not everyone realizes, is that comp JIT compiles become synchronous when you do count equals zero. Cause you're basically telling the compiler, I want you to compile this before it executes. 
And the only way to guarantee that it gets compiled before it executes is to actually stop the application thread that's trying to invoke this method <laughs> while you JIT compile it so that you can actually call the JIT compiled code instead of calling the interpreter. And so that further bogs down everything. You're basically just doing JIT compilations and you're not running any code. Third thing is, um, the JIT actually relies on profile data that the interpreter collects. <laughs> Hotspot does this, OpenJ9 does this. If you're not interpreting, there's no profile data. There's no guidance for whether this if is, you know, going to go bias this way or bias that way, or if it's even or whatnot, right? Or what the frequency of this loop is. Does this loop execute many times or not, right? Uh, the JIT compiler takes advantage of all of those kinds of things. And if you're not collecting profile data, then it's just not going to do a good job compiling the code. And finally, another variant of that is that the JIT inlining heuristics look at whether targets are compiled in order to figure out some, some aspects of hotness. So if it sees a loop that has um, a, a call in it and that thing hasn't, the, the target of that call hasn't been compiled, then clearly that loop hasn't executed very many times. It can conclude that and decide, I'm not going to do any inlining of that or I'm not going to you know, optimize that loop because it doesn't look like that thing's been compiled. But in this case, everything's been compiled. So it's, you've taken that sort of knowledge away from the JIT. And so it can't do as good a job at you know, spending its resources. Um, so don't do that, <laughs> is my advice. <laughs> uh, you're almost always way better off letting the default JIT heuristics work. Or if you are, if you are dead set on changing counts, um, change from where the counts really are, which is somewhere up around 3,000, I think, is the default for, for compile. So, you know, don't change 3,000 to zero. <laughs> change it to 2,500 or 3,500 or something like that. Um, uh, another thing that people tend to assume, so AOT code is code that's, is, is JIT code that's cached in the shared class cache, so you can reuse it in other JVM runs. They're not equally performant. So, um, we also, it's, it's sort of like this count equals zero, we have this dash x AOT, force AOT, compile everything and store it into the cache. Um, this can have a similar kind of problem because the AOT code is a little bit slower than JIT code. So if you're only using AOT code, it's gonna be 10%-ish slower, and for some apps it'll be more than that just because, you know, it's just a rule of thumb. Um, because we need, to, we need to hedge on some speculative ops, we won't be able to optimize that code quite as much. Um, and while we have heuristics that help with upgrading um, AOT code compiles to JIT code compiles, those take time to kick in. Uh, and if you're AOT compiling everything, it's just, again, it's just way more workload for the JIT compiler to chew through. Um, there's actually an option that we have called dash x tune virtualized, which among other things, it will do this force AOT in a way that actually works pretty well. Um, dash x tune virtualized is something that we, that we um, sometimes recommend in cases where you're running in a very constrained uh, containerized environment. Sorry. If I don't do something about that, it's going to start making much more noise. <laughs> um, uh, so it, it would be way better to use that, um, that ash, dash x tune virtualized option than to use um, x AOT force AOT yourself. And then, uh, and then the other thing is uh, in the in the use of the uh, the cloud compiler, um, you know, it's not it's not always uh, a, a boon. It does shift compilation resources away from the client runtime, uh, and it comes along with the extra cost of managing a JIT compiler um, service. Um, but it's really easy to start, actually. Um, there in in it in every Semru JDK, you know, like there's a bin slash Java command, there's a bin slash JIT server command. You can just run JIT server, tell it which port to listen on. <laughs> and then you can run uh, with a couple of command line options to Java to connect to the server. So it's really easy to use. Um, but if you, if you have lots of different JVM clients all connected to the same JIT server, and you start them all at the same time, <laughs> they're all going to flood the server at the same time. And it's, it's going to take, again, it's going to take time to chew through things. So it's better if you can stagger your start. So it, it works better in the scenario where um, you're trying to elastically start and, and stop instances in your cloud workload necessarily than when you're like very f the very first startup, although we are doing work to try and improve on that, but, but that's kind of the, the place where it works best right now. Um, and then on top of that, uh, try to keep your communication latencies between wherever you've deployed the cloud compiler and your JVM clients to below one millisecond if you can, which is usually not that bad. 
All right, I'm almost done. Sorry, I know I've been talking for, wow, two hours. Two hours? Two hours, holy. All right, go me. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, focus areas, uh, so we're gonna continue advocating. <laughs> Uh, but we'll probably be focusing a little bit less on developer conferences and more on building relationships with, with key open source projects and trying to make sure that things work really well. Um, you know, Jenkins, JUnit, maybe Spring Boot, I don't know. Um, or Spring, you know, the, lots of people like that. Um, but you'll still, if you're at conferences and you see us, you know, come say hi, we're still there. We still, we're still interested in talking to everybody. <laughs> Um, we are trying to work on our highest priority usability gaps going forward. So JFR is one of those trying to figure out this Java object layout tool thing. Um, and you, I should have included JMH in there. I don't have any specific work that we're doing right now for JMH, but it is one of the usability gaps that we need to work on. And as I mentioned, we're implementing that crack API uh, on top of our CRI use support. Um, and then we've made We've already made a lot of these improvements uh, happen in the latest release, so we just released everything in August. Um, so we're making lots of good improvements in startup performance with shared class cache and with instant on, uh, reducing memory footprint by another kind of 10-ish percent under load. Um, we've been improving ramp up quite a lot by uh, reducing compile um, compile times, like optimizing the compiler itself basically so that it can spend less time doing a particular compile. Uh, as well as also um, managing resources better in that ramp up state and using a cloud compiler, um, uh, especially for very small containers, like one core, you know, a couple hundred megabytes. And uh, yeah, finally that those key instruction sequences that I mentioned that we were, we found we'd been uh, derelict <laughs> in measuring those on a regular basis. So we'll, be starting to measure those a lot more regularly and also catching up on the, the, the mistakes that we found. So um, this worked better at a conference, but it's still true here. <laughs> um, um, I, I, am, I am still curious, so I, I know not many of you are using OpenJ9, but I'm still curious about what you think we could do or how, how, you, how we could do better at this. Um, how, if there's anything I could do to get you guys more involved or to, you know, if, if you would like to try any of this, I'd love to help. Um, anybody with uh, with that um, <laughs> and I provided some great icebreakers so you know how to talk to me <laughs> but I don't think in a conference that matters more than in this environment I'm gonna stop now <laughs> sorry I took so long <laughs> my beer lasted <laughs> um, if you have questions I'd be happy to take questions now or we can just go into group chat mode or, <laughs> or whatever. Sure. Questions? Yeah. I have a question. So when you use the like remote JIT, what's like, because if you have like one container, it's probably better to just like have one. Yep. So like, what, like yeah. how many containers would you kind of want to do to like offload to the JIT? It depends. I mean, it, 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 it kind of depends on how well spaced out and what the workload is. I would say, you know, we, we, we've run uh, like that environment where we got the 33% improvement in, there was probably on the order of 15 clients connected to one server. Okay, yeah. um, we're, we're not fully able to reuse JIT code across, across clients right now. This is something that we're working on improving right now. I would say we're, we're kind of, um, in our development of this JIT server technology, we're kind of there's, I kind of I break it down into three stages, right? The first stage is, is trying to collect all of the, like right now, you, like it, it, without a JIT server, you've got JIT compiler workloads spread out across your cluster. We're trying to first bring that work to one place, right? That's phase one. The second phase is, okay, you've got all that work in one place. Let's see if we can do that more efficiently, reuse effort when we're compiling code for different clients. That's the phase that we're kind of in right now. The third phase is what, cool stuff can we do to optimize across the cluster that we haven't done yet, right? So most JIT compilers exist inside a JVM. They have a view of the world that is a single Java application and they have no view of anything else. The JIT server has a much a potential for a much broader view of what's going on across a cluster of microservices, as well as um, the ability to do profiling across different things and, and take advantage of that. And because it's, a, because it's an independently um, uh, managed service, 
with its own resources, you can do things in that JIT compiler service that don't affect the runtime of, of different things. So you can afford to do, say, like super high opt compile. If you decided it was a really good thing to do, you could do that and use the, use the resources in the server without necessarily you know, killing one of the clients <laughs> with this high opt compile going on. Yeah? Um, so the impression I got um, from your talk was that if I am a developer and I'm working on microservices that run in stateless containers, mm -hmm. if I modified my build process to um, generate a shared class cache by, like, say, running tests and, yep. and saving that, yep. and I put that in my container, yep. and then I deploy that, I can maybe get you know this faster start time yep. and reduced memory usage. Yes. But I'm curious, like. Uh, what do you think is like the the scenario you're likely to see if you just do a drop-in replacement in that scenario? So I'm using stateless containers. Right. So I just replace hotspot. Yeah. So you'll so half the memory because yeah. that's not dependent on shared class cache or anything like that. That's that's heap management plus internal efficient data structure management inside the JVM. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the that's the most likely thing that you'll see. Okay. You can also um, uh, you will also, if you're running in very small containers, like one core, couple hundred megabytes, mm. you will probably see better ramp up by default. Okay. Because the JIT compiler, our JIT compiler is taking, it, it knows when it's running in that environment and it, it accommodates the, the size of the container to ramp up faster. Mm. Um, you, uh, the, the one thing that you'll have to be careful about is so uh, OpenJ9 does use a default shared class cache. You'll want to make sure that when you build your container that that isn't kind of having the cold start problem of the <laughs> of the JDK. So if I would say if you're gonna if you're gonna just drop in, not do any stuff, I would start by just just dropping it in and see what happens, see what you get. And then the second thing I would try is running with dash shared classes none to make sure that you're not having any any sort of cold run um, problems with mm -hmm. that. And that should be it okay. to get to get that memory improvement awesome. in principle. <laughs> and I'd love to, if you try it, I'd love to hear <laughs> how it goes and if it works or if it doesn't. <laughs> yep. I have a question about the release process, please. So yep. like in a couple of weeks, there will be Java 23 release. Yep. All the hotspot forks, they will probably like publish their builds in a couple of days. Yep. So what about the IBMs? Right. Page? Yep. Okay. So um, <laughs> so Java 23 is probably a different answer than you'd normally get <laughs> uh, because uh, there actually isn't a whole lot of uh, new JVM work that came in Java 23. So what we're hoping with Java 23 is that we're going to release within a week or two of uh, when OpenJDK, really like when Oracle first releases, so basically the end of September is what we're hoping for in, in Java 23. That's not the usual experience, I would say. More typically, we're releasing um, within a couple of months, maybe. Like, we've been a little bit behind on some. The worst, I think, was Java 21, which was four months behind. So it came out in September 2021 with Oracle, and we released uh, our Java 21 on distributed platforms on, uh, which is all the platforms you know about, <laughs> uh, in in January of 2021, 2022. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. So um, uh, we are trying very hard to keep that gap as as fast as possible. But we are operating at a little bit of a disadvantage because we can we we can only uh, react to the work that's being committed to the releases, and the work that's being committed to the releases happens in the six months before they get released, right? Like you only find out like right now the JEP list for Java 24, which is going to be released in March next year, is under construction, right? There's one. The last I looked, which I think was this morning, was there was one JEP targeted for JDK 24 right now, <laughs> right? So we know that one's there, but we don't know what else would be there. So um, we're always uh, watching OpenJDK. Like we're, we're present at OpenJDK and, and contributing in places. Um, and so we have our guesses for what things are going to be released in the upcoming Java versions. 
but we're not always right. And virtual threads was one of the ones that we got a little bit wrong. <laughs> we did not realize that virtual threads was going to go from second tech preview to second preview to in the platform in Java 21. So we weren't anticipating that and that caused us to, like we had to adjust, <laughs> readjust our, our development on, along that line. So that's why we were four months behind. But usually it's a couple of months. So um, I would say we've, n we've been releasing, you know, there's like a, um, each feature releases dot zero then there's, a, there's an update release that happens one month later, which is the usual update release, that's dot one. And then three months after that, there's a dot two. We're usually, we usually miss the dot one, but we're there for the dot two, somewhere in, in and around there. So. I want to put a follow-up question. Yep. Do you have to work on the new features as part of the Yes. Review? Yeah, we do. It's we do. The there are TCK tests that come out for the preview uh, features so as well. So we have to... Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's some things don't. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Nathan or Teresa knows whether those ones, that one specifically, had uh, an impact in the JVM. So the. There's only there's only only the JVM ones, like the ones that have a JVM impact. Those are the ones that matter most to us in, in OpenJ9. Where and there's lots of JEPs that don't have any. Like it's just purely Java C or, um, or or things like that. They don't change the bytecode definitions or anything. 